Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BH virtual event space. You are all tuned into Acquired Family Photo Collections, five common challenges, and what you can do as part of Save Your Photos Month here with the photo managers. For that, I would like to give a warm welcome to our guests for today, Kathy, Kathy Nelson with the photo managers and Courtney Plaster. Kathy, Courtney, how are you ladies doing? Really Great. good. Thanks for having us. Wonderful to have you both on. Kathy, this is the part of the show where I say, you do my job better than me. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you introduce Courtney and uh, talk about what we're going to be talking about today as part of this month-long uh, event stream that we have going on. And uh, I'll see you ladies in a bit for some Q&A. Thank Thanks, you. Derek. Welcome, everybody, again. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Kathy Nelson. I'm the CEO and founder of the Photo Managers, and we are the sponsors who bring uh, in the month of September. It's called Save Your Photos Month. And the goal is to provide educational classes for free to consumers that are just overwhelmed with all their photos. We started it in response to natural disasters and how to get your photos before flooding and things happen. But then we realized people need help with their photos at all times. And so Courtney's going to do a great job today. She owns Declutter Digital, and she's going to talk about, you know, when your family, somebody passes away or somebody downsizes or somebody moves and you inherit all those boxes or all those different photos, what can you do about that? So I'm happy to introduce Courtney. And I'll let you take it Thank from you here. so much. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so let me just share my presentation here. Um, so like Kathy said, my name is Courtney Plaster and I'm located in Carborough, North Carolina, which is just outside of Chapel Hill in RTP. I'm in North Carolina and um, my business provides families, professionals and small businesses with solutions to manage their photo collections and digital space with intention. And we're locally focused and we're women owned and we have been in business for about three years now. So I'm happy to be here for Save Your Photos Month. We are um, coming across these kinds of scenarios with our clients all the time and I love to talk about it. And I was actually mentioning earlier um, this, I've been on the personal side of this scenario over the summer. My mom just moved out of her house of 37 years and I helped her collect all of her photos from um, her the whole time she was there and it was such a mess she was pulling photos from above her dryer and from the linen closet I thought I had one box but then I ended up with three bins and then they kept on coming so um, these acquired photo collections can come from many different scenarios. Um, so think about one of these two scenarios. Your parents are downsizing and moving across the country, and they are moving into a smaller apartment. Your dad doesn't want to get rid of anything, but your mom could care less and is ready to throw it all away. You travel to their home to help them go through everything. And all of a sudden, your dad becomes very emotional. You're not really sure how to um, handle his emotions. And you um, are kind of at a loss from where to go at that point. Or your father has just passed away and your mother is requiring some memory care. And so she moves to your hometown. She brings with her a garage full of photos, albums, boxes. You don't have the room for them. So they end up in your sister's garage. Your sister could care less. She just wants her garage back. And so the project stalls. So like all family dynamics are different, all photo organizing projects are different. And you can acquire these collections from many different um, ways. So your parents could be aging and downsizing. You have relatives who have passed away and these photos are being kind of passed down the line. Your siblings are spread apart. And then all of a sudden, all of these collections sort of merge into one, or you might be the last interested family member left who's kind of dealing with this photo collection. Maybe the older family members don't really even care anymore to deal with them. So now what do you do? There are five main challenges that I have come across in working with my clients, and those are communication challenges, people having different opinions on what to do with all of these photos, organizational challenges, how to collect everything, how to sort them, how to deal with missing information, and then how to preserve and properly share your photo collections. So I'm gonna go through all five of these challenges today, and I'm gonna give you some solutions and tips on what you can do while you're going through your family photo collections. And then along the way, I'm gonna share some fun tools and apps that you can use that'll help the project go a lot smoother. So the first 
challenge that you might come across is a challenge with communication. So a lot of times you'll inherit these photo collections because someone has become ill, someone has downsized, or someone has passed away. And a lot of times there are really strong emotions that are tied to these photo collections. So the people who were previously the owners might not be ready to talk about it. They might, it might be too difficult to go through the photos. And so that can be one challenge. You may have other family members that while they're sad that the relative has passed or is taken ill, they just don't care so much about the photo part of it. They care about other things tied to the, that family member. And so they just might not be a lot of help. So some of the things that you can do to improve the communication for your project is to keep the communication open, get everybody together, express your interest in this project and how important it is to you. It's likely that once you tell people that you're interested, then everyone else is going to feel a big sense of relief and give you free reign to take care of it. Um, you can also create a project timeline, and if you're the one who's managing the project, that's going to help you keep yourself on track, but it'll also help other family members who are involved kind of understand the process and just keep everything organized while you're going through it. The second big challenge that you may come across is people having different opinions on what to do with the photos. So like the examples in the beginning, you may have one relative that wants to keep everything and you may have another relative who wants to throw it all away. These projects can be really overwhelming and time consuming, but they can also be very expensive when you're talking about starting to digitize all of these photos and media. So figuring out what to keep, what to digitize, you're gonna have to come to some agreement there. And then you're gonna have a budgetary concern as well. Are you gonna be the one paying for the project? A lot of times my clients, the older relatives are paying for the organization because they realize it's important. They just can't physically um, take care of the project themselves. So they've asked their children or other relatives to help. And so things that, oops, excuse me, things that you can do to help with these different opinions is to go back to your open communication and be collaborative. Um, try to find a common ground. You know, you can't be totally one way or the other. There might be some people that they don't want to keep as much, but if you offer to pay for digitizing or saving extra photos, they, that you know, they might be okay with that. Um, you can also designate a project manager to take care of this whole project, which likely might be you if you're here listening to this talk right now. And scheduling family meetings, kind of touching base regularly on the progress, I think is going to also keep everything on track and keep other people involved so that you can sort of lead the project, but you're also letting other people feel like they're having their say in how things are going and they don't have their feelings hurt because you've just taken control of the whole situation. So here's one fun tool that you can use. It's online and free. You can go to trello.com. And this is a an organizing board that I made. The style is um, the board view. It's called a Kanban board. But you basically create columns of your progress. And then you can create these tasks. So I have an inventory list and then some common columns or status columns would be to do in progress completed, but you can also, I customize these. And so I had the to sort column and then what's been sorted and then what needs to be scanned and what has been scanned. And you can create each card or task, and then you can just take things and move them around and keep track of your status this way. It's really visual, which I like. There's some other project management tools online, but this one is just really easy to use. And you can also assign tasks to other people if you have other people helping you. And that way they can kind of know what they're in charge of and what you have taken care of. 
And then this is another fun tool that I made in Canva, which there's also a free version there at canva.com. And this is a family tree. This might be a fun way to get your relatives on board if they're a little hesitant to participate or give you a lot of information. You might be able to hand them a family tree like this, and then all of a sudden they're filling in all of this information. It can be really helpful to have birth dates or death dates for relatives and names, especially when families start to kind of become all mixed up through marriage and the generations are going back, um, it can get really confusing. And so having a chart like this is going to help you keep things straight. I would say the biggest challenge that we encounter is how to organize the photos once you get them, how to collect all of them. Like with my mom, I thought I had one box. Suddenly I had five. She was pulling photos out of the woodwork. Um, the, first, the first challenge you'll probably experience is an initial sense of overwhelm. The volume is going to often very large and it can just feel like you don't even know where to start. You might also not know how to structure this project because there's so many moving pieces or so many people that are involved. And then lastly, how to get everything into one place, how to sort them, call the collection down because you probably don't want to keep everything. So some of the things you can do to help with this is to create a plan and to stick with it. I think that that's the biggest thing when you start with one idea and then midway through, you think this isn't working, I'm gonna do it this way. A lot of times you can backtrack, it can, you can lose progress. So I think if you, you know, trust your instincts, if you start with something, try to see it through and work in bite-sized pieces. So if you are open your garage door and there's boxes to the ceiling, don't think, oh gosh, I have to, organize and sort through all of this stuff, pick one box, pick the oldest box. In the photo organizing industry, we have a, um, we say that your digital photos are the most susceptible to loss because they're digital, but living in the South, it gets really, really hot here in the summer. And a lot of people keep these photos in their garages, which is not great. So I would argue that really old photos stored in a Southern garage, summer after summer in the humidity, they're just as susceptible to loss. So if that feels easy for you, start with that. And one rule of thumb that we also like to say, which can keep it simplified is to know your ABCs. So when you're going through these boxes or albums of photos, you're likely not going to want to keep everything. You may have duplicates or even triplicates from drugstore prints. So an easy way to sort them all is to think ABCs. So A are for the photos that you'd like to display. You want to put them in an album. You want to frame them, keep them out, and look at them. B is for the box. So something that you want to keep but you don't need to have out. It might be like a middle, you can't make up your mind, but it's just going to go into a storage container for now. C is for can, like trash can. These could be blurry photos, photos that don't have any context. A lot of times landscapes with no one in the shot is not as compelling of a photo as a landscape with your son in front of Mount Rushmore or just a mountain. Um, and then S, if there's a really funny story or compelling story attached to that photo, then those are really fun to look through and you can tell the story while you're um, looking through all of your photos. I also tell my clients that it's easiest to do the C part of this first. I think it's harder to differentiate A from B, but you can go through pretty quickly and find all the duplicates, throw those away, find all the blurry photos, or relatives you don't remember, friends that your kids had when they were four, throw those away. And then you can spend a little bit more time sorting between A and B. 
And then this is another tool that I use all the time. This doesn't have to be related to a photo organizing project. You can use this in your daily life. It's called an Eisenhower matrix. And this is a really easy way to delegate tasks. And it's similar to the ABC where there is a don't do this section. And I think those are always the easiest things to identify first. But then you from there, you can identify the things that are most important. You do those things that you can do at another time, things that you can let someone else do, and then things that you don't need to do at all. So this is a really great way when you're feeling that sense of, oh, geez, I don't know how to start, then try this Eisenhower matrix because you might be able to identify at least the number one and the number four, and then you can figure out two and three tomorrow. And then here is just a really simple spreadsheet that I made on Google Docs. I use this because it's collaborative. I can send it to clients or you could send it to your family members. And this is a timeline. So this is different than a family tree where this you're identifying people and associated dates and events. And this is going to help you as you start to sort your photos chronologically you can remember that your dad went to this Boy Scout trip when he was 16. And the year he was 16 was such and such. And you can write all that down. And so then if you find these photos of him in this Boy Scout retreat, you'll know about what year it is. Or you graduated rated excuse me, graduated from high school on a certain year, someone was married on a certain year. So this is a, another way to maybe pull in these relatives that are apprehensive to help is to sort of give them a sheet like this and see if they can remember when their uncle was drafted for the war or when they graduated from college. One of the most challenging, but sometimes fun, um, challenges when you're going through these photo collections is missing information. And there's always going to be missing information. Now that we don't really print photos, you don't get the really nice note on the back of the pictures. But there was a time where people took really detailed notes and wrote them on the back. There may be a time stamp on the photo that can help you identify. Um, but this is going to be tricky for the really old ones. Um, you're going to have old photos of family members you don't know who they are, you're going to have old photos without a date. And then most recently, my clients, they're the last keepers of these photos and the oldest relatives are, they've either passed away or they're having some memory care issues and they are having trouble with remembering the details. And so they just aren't, even though they want to help, they can't remember. So there are some fun solutions for this that I have come across, um, but the, I would say the first option is to reach out to these older relatives and just ask them. They might remember. My dad was sitting on a bunch of old photos and I kept going through them thinking, who is Al? Who is Al? And he never talked about Al. And then when I asked him, he said, oh yeah, we well, know Al was my uncle's best friend and blah, blah, blah. So even though they're not forthcoming and sharing this information, somebody might know. Um, I also, um, as a fun fact, I was a hairstylist for 20 years before I started this business. And so looking at old hairstyles is one of my favorite things to do to try to at least pin down a decade, but hairstyles, fashion, swimwear, especially, and then cars. Those are all really good clues on um, identifying at least decades in photos. And then um, there are some software and technology tools, one of which I'm going to show you next. But um, one thing um, that I did want to just mention in case you're going to DIY your own photo organizing and start to scan them, that it's nice to at least group your photos by a decade. You don't have to be spot on, but if you're going to digitize photos, there's a date that's going to become associated with the file. Once your print photo becomes a file, 
it's going to get a date and that date will be the date that you scanned that photo unless you manually change it. And so then if you were to upload or import all of these photos into say Apple photos or Google photos, it's going to chrono chronologically sort them. So say this photo of these ladies on the beach will be shuffled to September 2023 instead of the maybe like 1910s or 1920s. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. So even if you're just going to batch date change things, you can change everything to 1920. And that way, when you add them to your photo viewing software, they're going to be in the right place. And um, speaking of our software tool, this is a really fun free tool called Google Lens. And this is basically search it. It does a lot of things besides an image search, but um, you can search an image and it'll pull up other internet search results that match this image. So I did a test on some older photos that I had. I used two vehicles and then a building. And I just scanned the photo with my phone using Google Lens, and then it brought up these visual matches. And it might not be exactly the same day, but at least within a decade, you could get this Chevy Standard 6 car in the middle. This was an interesting kind of army tank vehicle. And then I thought this was really interesting. I didn't know what building this was. My dad's from New York, but this is the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which I thought was really amazing. And I think this photo is probably from the 20s or 30s. The last challenge that I wanted to talk about is preserving and sharing, which might be one of the most important because the whole reason why you're doing all this work is so that you can keep these for future generations and share them with other relatives. So when you're organizing all of these and sorting them, you're going to have questions about which, which types of boxes you should use where you should store your physical photos and then how to share them either physically or digitally, but a lot of people have questions about cloud storage or how they can get the photos to their aunt who lives on the other side of the country or maybe someone even overseas. So what I like to tell people is you always want to store your photos in archival boxes. These are boxes that are made with special materials that will help your photographs from degrading any further. Um, you also always want to store your photos in a climate controlled environment, always, 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 never in your garage or your attic or your crawl space, you want to have them inside. And then for digital sharing, sharing online via some cloud service is really powerful. Um, you go, you know, you scan all these and someone might give them back to you on a USB flash drive or external hard drive, but once they're uploaded into a cloud service, then you're all of a sudden, your relatives are just clicking through all of these photos on their home computer and they're able to see them and it's so powerful. Ooh. And this is one of my favorite storage boxes from a company called Archival Methods. This is their large storage kit and it has just about everything you need to get started. It has a big, it's, I think it's 11 by 17. It comes with one large manila envelope for larger documents. And then it has caddies for four by six prints and five by seven prints. There are some poly bags that you can put the really old photos in or anything really brittle so you can handle them. And there's a USB holder. And then um, it comes in this really nice comes in gray, tan, and black, and then you can put a label on the front so you can display it. It's really beautiful. So for review, um, you're going to maybe acquire some large family photo collections, and the common challenges you may encounter are communication with your relatives, everyone having a different opinion on what to do, how to organize, how to collect, how to sort the photos, how to deal with missing information, unknown faces, unknown places, and then how to preserve and properly share your photos once you organize and digitize them. And I just wanted to thank you so much for this presentation. I think we're gonna open it up to a Q&A if anybody has any questions and I will send it back to B&H. 
Thank you so much, Courtney. And yes, we will open it up for some q and I'm going to get the Q&A started because I'm one of eight kids. And yeah. when my mother did actually have batteries or film in her camera, that was the family joke always growing up was, oh, wait, I don't have film or I don't have batteries. But we do have a lot of, there's a lot of prints floating around. So what do you find is, is it really, I, I to be honest, we, we've been talking about archival a lot with the photo managers. I never really thought about that family aspect of because it's pictures and it's not like an inheritance, so to speak, or like money. We always think money. OK, you're, you're going to find siblings turning and on one another and it creates this whole dissension. But I never thought about that, about images and the archival aspect. Is that really is that, is that more of an issue than the the bread and butter of archival, which is scanning or getting your hands on prints? Or is it do you do you find that it's kind of interesting to me? Yeah, I mean, it's it is interesting. I think people phase in and out of interest in if they want them or not. And even within, you know, siblings, people, some are interested and some are not interested. And so, um, yes, I think everyone agrees that they should be preserved and scanned. But then which ones to preserve and scan, I think is that's the harder conversation to have. And I remind people sometimes to to keep and digitize things for future family members, because just they might not think that a photo or document is relevant, but their niece might, or, you know, someone growing up might. And so then I say that and they think, oh, okay. And then they'll kind of reassess and then they'll bring me more to scan. I just had a project where it was a very small amount. And I mentioned that and she was like, oh, wait, let me go back. And then she handed me all of these really interesting documents that kind of went with this person. Yeah, it is an interesting conversation, that whole thing, because I, you know, I'm I'm the product of the film age, but I'm also a very big proponent of the digital age and scanning everything over. But I think, yeah, I, I would want to, I can't imagine even after scanning all of the prints, I am the type of person that doesn't delete anything as far as my raw files. So I would want to keep every single image, but I guess the older you get, you see less of a purpose. But I don't yeah. know, that's an interesting conversation yeah. to have. And there's something about holding it. It's really, it's powerful. I mean, I think we both split that generation where my childhood was in print and my my child's childhood is in digital. And But he likes to go, you know, when he's like rummaging through all the pictures I find, he loves it and you can hold it and touch it. And then you can talk about it more than just like scrolling through on your phone. Yeah, totally. And it was like, now it's like, you know, we have different mediums, but the difference between a Polaroid. And then you had a four by six and kind of oh, seeing yeah. the different processes and the different types of film. It was yeah. like, it was interesting to know. And the like, really tiny formats from the forties. Yes. Yeah. It's so cool. Cause it's like yeah. you, it was almost like there are, are the older generations version of like filters where it's yeah. like, well, I wonder what made them, did, were they thinking about this about, oh, film yeah. stock and right. why. And you had to be different. intentional because you only had so much film and it was expensive. Yeah. Totally. Well, I'm seeing the questions start to pour in, Courtney. So we'll start to to address those. John asking, is it safe to write on the back of a photo? Oh, good question. Um, it is as long as you're using the proper tool. Um, so you don't want to use a ballpoint pen because that will actually make an impression that can be visible from the front side of the photo when you're digitizing it. So a number two pencil works, but archival methods, um, who I love, they sell a pencil like an archival pencil. It's called a Stabilo is the brand. But um, yes, you can. You just want to make sure that you're using the right thing. So I would say look for an archival pencil. And if you can't, a number two pencil will be okay. And I'm going to throw a follow-up on there. Um, when writing in, on the back of a, a photo, from your experience, obviously who's in it, what year it is, is pretty self-explanatory. Is there any other information that you found to be helpful that people might not think of? Um, most people want to know, or when we're dating th or naming things, the date, the people, if there's a theme, you know, so it could be 1947, so-and-so's wedding, and if it was in a special location, you might want to put that. Um, this is sort of on topic, but I always think it's important. If there is handwriting, original handwriting on the back of the photo, I like to scan those because it's kind of an object of the other side of the photo. And so I tell my clients, don't also write on that, but like maybe do a sticky note for the, for the file naming purposes. But 
it like, you know, if it's your grandmother's handwriting, writing about your grandfather coming home from war, and then you're like, you know, 1942, you know, it kind of, um, I think detracts from how beautiful that original note was. So I would say use a stick, like a temporary sticky note and then scan your grandmother's handwriting and then you can write on the back. I'm glad I asked because I never would have thought of that. It's almost like its own piece of art. It is. Yeah. I had a client and it was father coming home after work at 5 p.m. That was a note on the back of a photo, which I thought was really special. Yeah, so. I I love that. It's it's so cool. And, and it gives you like a piece of it's a piece of them, the way they would write it. And, you know, my mother always scribbling stuff out because she got the date wrong. I got something yeah. wrong. And it's like, that's so my mother. Yeah. Um, Mom, I love you. Hope you're not watching. Um, <laughs> AJ joining us on YouTube. Once you scan the images, what's the best way to store them on hard drives online? Should you throw out the physical copies? What's your best Ooh. practices for that? Okay, so there is a three to one backup scenario that people like to talk about. So you want to have three different types of backups, your phone or your computer counts as one. Um, and then the second, and then two, let's see, three different types of backups, two different kinds, and then one offsite or in the cloud. So you would have them on an external hard drive, or I don't like flash drives for permanent because they're easy to lose. So if someone, if you use a service and they hand you a flash drive, move them to a bigger thing, like an external hard drive, and then copy them to your laptop or copy that hard drive somewhere else, and then push them up to a cloud service. And there's a bunch of different options there. Um, you know, a, a lot of my clients are Apple people, so they just use iCloud, which is not a true backup. It's a sync, but um, they are there in the cloud and it, you know, anything that makes it easy to share and it kind of acts as a secondary backup in the event of a fire or a flood. Okay. And as far as scanning, Linda's asking, what type of scanner do you suggest? Um, iPhone printer, or are you taking, you know, using a high resolution digital camera to take pictures or what do you recommend? So professional photo organizers are using some higher end equipment. A lot of us have a camera, it's called camera scanning setup. So we're taking a super high res photo of a photo essentially. Um, those are really good for large format things or things that are really delicate that you don't wanna handle too much. Um, but even a really nice bigger flatbed can be a little expensive. Although Epson has just come out with, I can't remember the model, but it's about a hundred dollars and it does a great job. So if you're trying to do this at home, um, I'm just going to give you a heads up. It's tedious as heck, but it's doable. And that Epson, the smaller scanner, it's portable, it's USB powered. You can carry it around with you. And that's a nice one to, you know, to start with. And then you might decide that you don't want to deal with that. And then you hire a photo organizer. <laughs> <laughs> Look. I'm not paid by them, but I'm telling you, I have a scanner. Number one, my scanner is not take everywhere. It's it's large. That's why I, I stopped scanning, but it is. It's tedious. And then you get into, you know, the settings. And if you it doesn't scan right, you have to go. Yeah, it's just like taking a photo and then having to edit it. And it's yeah. very, very, very tedious. So there's certain things that are better paid for and outsourced. That's my unsolicited <laughs> two cents there. Uh, John D on Vimeo asking, is there a way to digitally identify people, places, events of digital photos without having many folders? I'm guessing mm -hmm. John and John, if you can, it, it looks like John's asking, I guess more, it looks like for key tagging. Maybe this is, maybe this is an effect of with the iPhone. It's so good at identifying and grouping together with via algorithms where you don't really have to put everything in a separate folder, it kind of the yeah. algorithm does it together. Is there anything out there AI wise that smart systems kind of like how the iPhone has it for cataloging? Yeah. Or... I'm not as familiar with the newest AI stuff. I know Lightroom has a facial recognition feature, which is private. Some people don't want to use like a kind of like open sourced facial recognition AI. Amazon is like crazy good. Um, and I mean, so is Apple Photos. They identified my cat in a photo that I did a test on. But um, yeah, Lightroom, you can set some tags and you can do, um, you know, you can sort of sort by dates, but you're still going to probably want to folder them. But yeah, I think if if I'm understanding the, what you're saying, like Apple Photos and Amazon Photos, they sort of have their like pre-existing buckets of places and people and things. 
And okay. I think, you know, those like big companies, they probably do the heaviest lifting as far as AI stuff goes. Okay. And John, if I totally missed the mark on your question, please, please, please correct me. Um, Chuck kind of had a similar type of question asking if you can recommend any software for organizing such as labeling, categorizing a collection of digitized photos. Mm -hmm. So we used Lightroom, which can be a bit of a learning curve and it's pretty robust. Um, I don't always recommend it for my clients because it's a little bit of overkill. Um, but if you're doing this yourself and you have a large collection, it might be worth looking into because you can import everything. There's some light editing work that you can do, but then you can create collections of photos and then use all of the kind of metadata tagging facial recognition within that software and then export it out. So that might be, aside from sort of like an Apple Photos scenario, that would probably be the best thing to do. Okay. And AJ asking, what resolution, bit depth, format, et cetera, should you use for archiving photos? Can digitization companies be trusted to scan in full? So let's break this down. <laughs> resolution, bit depth, format, how much is overkill? How much are most people going to need? Okay, so... I'll tell you what's like what I do and then I'll tell you what you can maybe get away with. But um, I scan everything at a 600 DPI um, default and then I scan them in as TIFF files because you can always export them as a JPEG later. Um, a TIFF file is better if you want to do any printing. Um, and then, but most people are going to need a JPEG for sharing, for online sharing. Um, and so I don't give them both unless they are saying they want to take these files and have them professionally printed somewhere else. Often I'll print them on their behalf and then the files they get are JPEGs. Um, 300 is a print minimum, but I go 600. Um, and then if you're doing negatives, you just have to keep in mind that that's a 3200 DPI, well, my default is 3,200 because you're going to be enlarging them. And so you just have to keep that DPI ratio around at minimum 300, but I do closer to six. Um, and then what was the other question? The other question is asking, can digitization companies be trusted mm -hmm. to scan in full archival quality? Or are they just going to give you something that looks okay on the computer monitor, but not in print? I think as long as you, if you can get what DPI they're scanning in. I mean, they shouldn't lie about that. And like, you know, a DPI is DPI. I think when, and I don't have experience using these companies, but um, I think like the devil is in the details where, you know, you might want to crop out and leave an original border because it makes it more object-like or you like the way that border looks and they might just be doing like a rough crop or things like that. Um, and so it's not, like, you know, one person is looking at each photo and doing like a custom crop for each of those photos, but 300 DPI is 300 DPI. It's still going to be good. And for, if you're not going to, I mean, 72 is a web maximum 72 DPI, but I always tell people if they're going to go through the trouble to pay for all of this, get them scanned in so that they could be reprinted if they lose everything. And I would think if you're reaching out to an archival company, you're going to, you're not going to send them your entire catalog of images without knowing, you know, maybe send them five images and say, Hey, just so you can have an example of how it's going to look. I mean, a lot of times it's user error where we print stuff. And if we print it on our own, it comes out horrible. And then you send it to a professional lab and it's going to be color corrected or they have options where it says, Hey, do you want color correction? Do you not sure. want it? And yeah. Right. Or, or you scan, you know, that tiny format I was telling you about, and then you try to blow it up to a five by seven and then, but it wasn't, you know, that then you lose that DPI or that resolution. Mm -hmm. Well, Courtney, looks like we got all of our questions answered. If you guys do right. have any other questions, Courtney dropped her information there and, you know, Kathy's going to be here all month. So we can always reach back out to Kathy if, uh, if we need to get in touch with anybody, if you guys have any lingering questions, but I want to thank Courtney for your time, your expertise, joining us here on the BNH virtual event space. Thank you so and... much. It was so fun. I hope it was helpful. Oh, definitely. You actually, it, it was good because for all the information you gave, you made me think about a lot more, like you, you kind of opened the box up to like, wait, I didn't even consider that as an, as even a thing. So awesome. <laughs> it's always good. It's always good to get, get it out there. Cause now I know 
where I need to go because this is this is a conversation that's relevant to a lot of not only me but a lot of people that yeah. are out there watching, especially yeah. our viewers. We're so. I think we're the kids of the baby boomers that are going to have a lot of photos to deal with really soon. Totally, this is an, yeah. an expanding industry for sure. And I see our dear friend Elizabeth Murphy got a question and I'm so sorry, Elizabeth, I didn't even see it there. <laughs> How do you convince a friend she doesn't have to print all 400 pictures to put in an album? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, no arms. All 400 anymore. to put in an album. Can you tell her that there's a photo maximum, like a, like a max photo account? There you go. I mean, I, twenty. Look, tell her I said 220 is an ideal number for an album. 220 is is that a good so so 220 <laughs> one of the <laughs> one of the Elizabeth. vendors i use is they say we can't do any more than 220 i'm like okay yeah or or you know what it, depending if it's a good friend i guess you could sit there and elizabeth if this is a really good friend sit there and maybe use all your experience from joining us on the event space here and taking them through a calling process and i think that's something that's always helpful in going like a this is what i do with my images where i don't want to throw anything out or i don't want to you know, you have a hard time, but then you go through a series of passes and it might take five passes, but you start to whittle that number down. Yeah, maybe she can try the ABCs and, you know, the landscape thing I never thought about until someone mentioned it, but like a mountain is a mountain and 20 years from now, you're going to like, if it's not mm. you standing in front of it, remembering like, oh, this is the trip I took in such a such year, then you're just at some point you're gonna be like, this is another mountain. And so, no, you don't need to keep that. Yeah, that is a great point. And I think um, sometimes the rip the bandaid off mentality of I'm just going to run, make my choice, run with it and never look back. And yeah. most times a week later, you don't even yeah. remember. Ooh, one remember. more thing. Sorry, I don't want to keep. I mean, hopefully. No, no, you're that. good. You're there's good. another there's a technique. I don't know if this works for photos because I've never tried it before. But with professional organizers, there's a technique where the client isn't allowed to touch anything and someone else holds it up. And then they have say like, keep it or toss it. And so maybe if Elizabeth like holds, he's like, yes, no. And then, but her friend isn't allowed to touch anything. Maybe that I like help. that. There's no, yeah. like, there's no like physical tie to it. Yeah. All right. And well, there, now that we got that question answered, we had AJ sneak one last quick question in what's the best service for ordering printed album books from digital files. Ooh, um, I, so I use a B2B printer, um, called Red Tree Albums and they make really, really beautiful books. They're based out of Kentucky. Um, but they are, uh, you would have to go through a professional to get them. And I don't have a lot of experience telling, you know, for like where you could go. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel comfortable. I'm sorry. I don't feel, no, I can't kind of just like throw out a printer, but um, yeah, I, so I specialize in kind of heirloom books. And so we do really nice ones, but there are some clouds, like all the cloud service providers offer printing. And if it's just, um, I don't want to say quick and dirty, but if it's like, you know, 2023, you want to get it in a book, you know, I'm sure that any of those vendors would do an okay job. But I think if you're looking for something really special, you might reach out to someone who has access to this kind of B2B environment because the quality is really nice. Yes, definitely. I'll, I'll double down on that, AJ. And I've, I've worked a fair amount with, with printing in both prints and books. And so this is my personal opinion. This is not the opinion of B&H or Courtney or the photo managers. Um, a lot of the the online print uh, publishers and self publishing outfits will send you they they'll send you samples. Get a sample, do something small, see if you like the quality. Don't go and do a four hundred page book. Do a do a two page, and just something. It, it's a small investment, but it'll at least give you an idea of the quality. And there's so many options as far as paper and 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 design and all of that. But I I will say what Courtney said is one hundred percent true. When you go through, there's a lot of printing services that will only deal with professional labs or professional uh, entities. And you will find that a lot of those are are going to be more what you're looking for if you're looking for a really high quality product. And if you're looking for something that's going to be archivable, you don't want to go um, with something that might just be a fly by night or online operation. I mean, Shutterfly, I'll throw Shutterfly out there. It's great for certain purposes for somebody who doesn't really put much they want to don't want to put much work in and they're just going to do a quick collection 
But for somebody who is going to say, I want the best possible high quality product, you may not want to go to a company like that. So without giving an opinion either way, do the research. Sometimes it's worth putting in a little bit of an investment in a small sample. And that way you can kind of get a feel for not only the quality of the product, but also how the company is from a customer service perspective. Because then if you do have any issues, um, you want to make sure it's very common in printing for those of you that don't print to have misprints. And no matter how well you format everything, you still might get it back and something might be off kilter. Um, and you want a company that is going to make a right at the end of the day. I can day. attest so, to that from yeah. on a professional level. Yeah. And, and that's something where it goes back to what you said, Courtney, when you're dealing with, you know, you go through a professional company that is then going to go through a professional printer that will not just work with, um, you know, somebody off the street. That relationship is there where Courtney can then go and say, hey, this is not kind of not up to our standards. The company will realize that. And it's it's a working relationship. So, yeah, there's my again, my unsolicited two cents. But <laughs> Courtney, hopefully we hopefully I don't have to opine on anything else today. We'll leave it up to the experts. But Courtney, huge thank you. Thank to you. you. Courtney Plaster from Digi Decluttered Digital. And a huge thank you, of course, to the photo managers for bringing us some really, really, really great guests on here. And to all of our viewers watching, getting your questions in, we always love to have you guys be a part of the show as well. That's all we got for now. Another rendition of the BH virtual event space in the books. Catch you all next time. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs>